and welcome to part two of my video series called the new newspeak. So in this video, I want to talk about doublespeak. You can pretty much thank George Orwell's novel 1984 for this topic. I think it's best for us to start with determining what doublespeak actually is. So the folks at Oxford Dictionaries define doublespeak as the following. A deliberately euphemistic, ambiguous, or obscure language. It would come to no one's surprise that this word is often applied to politics, marketing, and business in general. So how in particular does doublespeak play a role in this video? If we hop back in time for a bit to the period of the birth and death for the Third Reich, there was a man of particular interest. His name was Joseph Goebbels. Now, Jos now Goebbels, or Joseph Goebbels, was the head of Germany's Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Hey, at least they were honest about the last part. Propaganda was responsible for a fair portion of the Nazis' rise to power. For this reason, it would remain at the center of focus for Germany as it began to expand its territory rapidly, and then shrink. Now back to the individual of interest. Joseph Goebbels is known for his contributions to not just Nazi Germany, but also modern marketing, politics, and communication. He would end up creating a list in his diary which dictated his principles of what constituted good propaganda. Now numbers 14, 16, and 18 on his list are of particular interest to us. In English translation, they go as follows. Number 14. Propaganda must label events and people with distinctive phrases or slogans. Number 16. Propaganda to the home front must create an optimum anxiety level. Number 18. Propaganda must facilitate the displacement of aggression by specifying the target for hatred. Sound familiar? Neither have you I! Don't know me. You're a fucking a white male! So? You're a white man! So, it's come to my attention that there's been some controversy surrounding some three little words, and I don't understand why. It's just a bunch of people having hissy fits that their status quos are being challenged. <sighs> Die, cis, scum. It's time to tie this back into doublespeak. Doublespeak is notable because it appears to the viewer as clarity or an attempt at clarification. But in reality, it's actually a veil of obfuscation and confusion designed to deny one knowledge of understanding of the truth. It achieves this with words or phrases that provoke a different emotional response than what would otherwise be the case. The change of illegal in the phrase illegal immigrant to undocumented embodies this well as it is euphemistic in nature. Now with a brief historical case study under our belts, it's time to give the phobias of doublespeak a quick look. Now in the wonderful world of tolerance, words like homophobic, xenophobic, and Islamophobic get thrown around a lot. Why would these constitute doublespeak, you might ask? Ask anyone what a phobia is, and they'll likely tell you it's an irrational fear. Once again, that's an irrational fear. And yet, one can still get labeled xenophobic for just disagreeing on mass immigration being a positive thing. This should begin to highlight an apparent attention of the utilization of these words, used even in cases where irrational fear is clearly not a motivating factor. If we quickly refer back to Nazi propaganda tactics from Joseph Goebbels and pull out the ideas of creating anxiety, directed aggression, and the labeling of people with distinctive phrases or words, you should start to see a connection. The phobias are notable for carrying harmful connotations, and because they originate from the word phobia, they make it inferable that the labeled party is irrational, paranoid, and ignorant. Now, it's pretty obvious what the intent of these words actually is, and what they mean to convey. In our next sections of words, however, not so much. Equality, rights, fairness, and even misogynist. All words that have what to many would seem to be a relatively objective and standard definition and meaning. 
except they don't at all in the public sphere. To better elaborate on this point, it's time for a bit of focus on feminism. Oh yay. <laughs> The movement that's all about equality until it isn't. For reference, I'm going to display a clip from Karen Strawn of Honey Badger Radio, an excellent, amazing show by the way, to give an excellent overview of what I actually mean. Links to both amazing channels are in the description below, by the way. And that brings me to feminism. You know, the patriarchy smashers, those righteous avengers of equality. Uh, dogged dismantlers of every single gender role. What exactly is feminism doing to dismantle this traditional role of the disposable male? Feminism's greatest victories have only reinforced in everyone that society still owes women provision, protection, help, and support just because they're women. In its collective dismissal and abandonment of male victims of domestic violence, it only reinforces in men that it's pointless for them to ask for help because men's needs are of no relevance and their fear and pain don't mean anything to anyone. Feminism teaches us to put women's needs at the forefront of every single issue, uh, political or social, whether that issue is domestic violence law, sexual assault law, institutional sexism, social safety net, education funding, homeless shelters, government funding for shovel-ready jobs that didn't stay shovel-ready once feminists got wind of them. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are feminists pushing their way to the front of the line, demanding women's fair share of all of the goodies, the good stuff, the, the loot, the booty, the cookies. Even if women don't need it, even if women don't deserve it, and even if somebody else needs it and deserves it more. And they get it. So how can this be? For this, we're going to take a look at the word equality. It's a funny and rather ambiguous word in politics. This is mostly because we run into the reality that there are two competing definitions used. The first is equality of opportunity. The second is equality of outcome. Now, in the dictionary, equality of opportunity is utilized in the definition of equality. But, in the language of modern liberalism, this is not the case. Affirmative action in the name of equality is an excellent example of this concept of equality of outcome. Such an idea, however, is rather unfavorable in the meritocracies of the West. But under the guise of it being the equality of classical liberalism, such Marxist and modern liberal ideas come more palatable. This is why, such as in the case of affirmative action as mentioned before, treating someone differently based on race, sex, whatever, to benefit someone else can be called an act of equality instead of an act of discrimination. Sticking with a the theme of feminism, no matter your stance on abortion, it is conditionally legal in many places, particularly in North America. However, it is not a right. Rather, it's something that we in North America in particular have made unillegal. So why do you hear so many individuals calling abortion a right? Well, firstly, because in doing so, it establishes the idea that such activity is an inalienable, God-given activity that is fully endorsed by the Bill of Rights of whatever nation it happens to be in. This gives a clear emotional response of anger when someone seeks to remove or replace abortion, or place further restrictions on such a right. This runs contrary to the reality, which is that it's already a regulated activity, and it's simply legally permissible, not a constitutional right. Essentially, it's about as much of a right as smoking is a right. You can do it, but it's not some God-given secret thing that's written in the constitution of whatever nation or state you happen to be in. Now. On to the next topic. This one isn't necessarily feminism, but hey, we're on a roll with this. Racist, all men are misogynistic. <laughs> oh yes, that lovely word heard by so many, but seen by so few. The original definition once meaning the hatred of woman, having also been amended to include the distrust of woman, which might be at least partially responsible for 
its usage now being commonplace. Obviously, hating the female sex is not a very popular thing, especially among males who have an outgroup bias towards females over other males. But with this new definition, the word can be utilized against a whole new horde of thoughts, ideas, and people. The manipulation is very apparent in this one. To conclude, doublespeak is an extraordinarily manipulative concept. By changing emotions and obfuscating facts by either excluding certain aspects or creating an ambiguous photo of a topic is how something like doublespeak works. Such a tactic finds its roots in the theoretical world of Orwell's 1984, the German Ministry of Enlightenment and Propaganda, and in our modern society, in which literal dictionaries actually exist for the sole purpose of defining words used in such a manner. So I think it's safe to say, be wary of what you hear. Or as the saying goes, don't read a book by its cover. Mm -hmm.